Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Perspectives. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. Um, Being Patient Perspectives, as many of you know, is an opportunity for us to hear about Alzheimer's from a first person perspective, those who have been diagnosed. And I'm so pleased to have joining with us Arthena Kasten. She is, um, was diagnosed at the age of 51 years old, um, just a few years back. Um, thanks so, so much for joining us, Arthena. Good afternoon. Thank you so very much, Deborah, for having me on your show this evening. So let's just start first with, um, this is a question I ask um, a lot of people who have been diagnosed um, with Alzheimer's disease. Before diagnosis, how did you know, how did you first recognize something may be wrong? Um, it was, my, my story is a little different from most people's stories because I knew that something was wrong because I had witnessed my father and six of his brothers and sisters actually also uh, had been diagnosed or were in the stages of uh, early onset or actually Alzheimer's disease. So I knew a little when I started having the problems such as um, I just could not seem to get simple things right. I was doing a little bit of forgetting um, and things that I had known forever just was now all of a sudden not commonplace for me anymore. So when you when you talk about not getting things exactly right, what exactly do you mean by that? Like it, I, presumably you were still working. I was, I actually was working, I had been working uh, with an insurance company for almost 20 years at that point. And things that were common coverages that I knew, because I talk to customers every day. So things that I knew to tell them, things I knew about their coverages or insurance or anything that they needed to know basically um, was all of a sudden not, I had to think back, I had to keep writing down things. And so then I got to the point, my husband said to me, write it down, write it down. And I kept saying, I should know these things. I shouldn't have to, you know, wonder why I can't remember. And yeah. then something as simple as, and I, when I tell this, it's, it's something as simple as I went to work one day, um, got off work and had left my car running the whole eight hours in the parking lot. And that was the beginning of me knowing, actually that was not the beginning, but that was near the end where I knew something was wrong. So I think back now, I think you know my daughter was planning a wedding at that time and she would tell me things to do or things to get ready to help her with the wedding, and I would just forget. Yeah. Wait, um, Arthena, I'm gonna ask you to move just a little bit closer to your computer, because sometimes when you um, back, we can't hear you very well, but that's perfect. Um, oh. That's better, yeah. I think that, Yeah, that's great, thank you. So um, I can imagine, though, for someone like you, because you have such a strong um, familial history of Alzheimer's d disease. Uh, did you fear that you would be diagnosed at some point? I did, I honestly did. Um, hours before I actually got the diagnosis, I actually had had this conversation with, with uh, one of my first cousins and we talked about it. And I said, at that point, do you think that we're, you know, that we may have that problem? And he said, yeah, probably we will, because his mother had had it. And so it, it made me a little afraid. And like I said, so that's why when I started having the problems, I knew what was going on. So you said it before, you, your father had Alzheimer's. Who else in your family has um, had Alzheimer's? My, my father has it. He has six brothers and sisters, and they all had it. Wow. Wow. And I'm assuming, is it early onset? Like with your diagnosis, is it an early no. onset? I was the only one that has the early onset. Did you, um, and you know, I, I asked this question, um, I, you know, if you, if you don't want to answer it, it's absolutely fine. But I'm curious, did you know your genetic status? Do you know if you have a genetic link to Alzheimer's disease? Um, I actually don't know if I have a genetic link. Um, I kind of almost can, pretty much say yes um, because it, it doesn't I don't know it just seems really odd that you have that many because I now even have cousins who have it now so I'm assuming that it is a genetic link 
So, um, Athena, when we talk to people who have been diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease, one of the hardest part is actually diagnosis, getting a diagnosis. What was that like for you? I mean, because you have such a strong familial history, was it easier to get diagnosed or did the doctors, um, you know, say, oh, you're okay? I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's just aging or it's something else. It was really hard. It was very hard getting the diagnosis. Um, as I said, I, I had, we, it was a joke I tell and I actually had been going to my, my doctor and I had been going to him for like 17 years. So when I started saying, I have a problem, I'm having a problem. He just kept saying, oh no, I think it's just menopause. I think you're going through anxiety. I think it's depression. We went back and forth with that forever. And then I finally just got to the point where I just didn't want to hear that anymore. And I finally asked, could he see, could I see a neurologist? And so he uh, sent me on to a neurologist who wasn't still not sure about the diagnosis, even though he had taken some, you know, some of the tests and things, but they just kept saying, you're just too young. You know, at that point, like I said, I was 51. So then he referred me on to a neuropsychologist. And from that point on, by the time he finished testing and uh, doing some more medical tests and asking me all these questions, I think I stayed with him like four or five hours that day. Um, he said, and I could tell by the time um, the conversation was over that it was going to be a, a definite diagnosis. And he said, I'll get back with you in a couple months. And when he called back on March 23rd, um, he had the diagnosis and he said, that's what it was. Um, I'm interested in the fact that, I mean, obviously you were given some cognitive tests. Why did it take, were you, did you get a, a PET scan? Did you get an um, MRI? Why did it take a couple of months before he could give you a definitive answer? He, he wanted to be sure. He just kept saying, I want to be sure. He, he just, because again, we, we were going back to that same phase of you're so young. You're so young. I, I, I just don't want to say this is what it is if it's not that. So he, uh, he just wanted to be sure, I guess. And so when he came back, he had the answer. So, the, so you were diagnosed at 51 years old. When did you start to have feel like you had problems? At, from that first moment that we talked about previously, how much time did, went by before you actually had a definitive diagnosis? I started having problems when I would say I was maybe in my late 40s, maybe 47, 48. So, yeah, it took about, so it took several years. So I would say 47, 48 was doing the time frame. Now, um, Arthina, when I have to say, uh, several people were like, you have to talk to Arthina. She's amazing. <laughs> she has such a positive attitude, uh, which I can see, you know, which is how, how are you coping with the Alzheimer's diagnosis? I mean, you're, you're so bubbly and smiley. I, I love it. I just, you know, it, it doesn't seem like doom and gloom in your eyes. You know what? I have, you know, Deborah, I think about it like this. I can be really, really sad and just lay down in my bed every day and just be, oh, whoa, me. But why? Why be like that? It's not going to change it. It is what it is. I have the diagnosis. I'm going to live with it. I'm going to enjoy what time I have. I have, you know, uh, two daughters, a loving husband, and an awesome grandson that I am going to enjoy until the end. So, you know, why Why I, I have this thing that I say every day, and I really believe it, and I say, if I wake up in the morning and I know my name and I know what today is, it's going to be a great day. So that's what I live by. That's wonderful. That is so wonderful. And what a great attitude. Do you feel like you have, um, I, do you feel like you're getting worse in any way or do you feel like you're maintaining? I can see that I can feel the changes little by little. I can feel the change. You know, every day, some days I wake up and it's, it's a great day and I, I won't tell you anything different. And then some days I wake up and I have to say, Alexa, what is today's day? You know, it, it, it's something, it's a, back and forth thing. You know, some days I'm real depressed and some days I'm just, so I can feel the changes, but I feel like I'm maintaining pretty well. I still drive, not long distances, but I still drive. I go to Hobby Lobby. I go all those places I want to go. 
you know. So I, I think I'm maintaining, and, and the really, stuff that's really keeping me good, because now I'm on the uh, early stage advisory council with, with uh, the Alzheimer's Association. They keep me pretty busy. I get to travel. I get to tell my story. And that, that just keeps me, oh, my gosh. I can't even tell you how awesome that is. Yeah, it's it's key to I mean for many people too, keeping busy is is and socializing right is the key yeah. to um, happiness. Did um, when you talk about those little changes, Arthena, like what is that like every day? I mean, aside from memory loss, are you experiencing mood changes? Like, tell us what it t tell us a little bit about you know what that's like. Well, you know, some, <laughs> because I am such a talkative person because I have this, this personality that I just want to meet every, my husband always makes the jokes and say, I would talk to a door if they would talk back. If I'm not, if I'm not in a talkative mood or if I just feel a little down, I play a lot of music. So if I'm, you know, I pull music to try and pull sometimes that help me out of that mood thing. But some days it is, like I said, I can get up and I just can't figure out, I may walk from my office to my bedroom 500 times without remembering what, what I came in my office for. So those are the things that, you know, I just don't do well with. Some days I'll get up and think I'm not going to leave my house because I'm just in a funk of a mood. But other than that, I, I do pretty good. I, I think I do. I think I do really well. I really do. How, how many, how may I ask how old you are now? I will be 56 on July 18th. So, so it's been almost four years since you've had a diagnosis then, but longer since you've been experiencing problems. Mm -hmm. I'll be uh, four years on March 23rd. So one of the reasons why um, we were so excited to talk to you is we know that Alzheimer's disease does discriminate with um, minority populations. There seems to be a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's um, in the African-American community. So talk to me a little bit about that as an African-American woman. Um, what is it, what is, um, you know, what is it like in terms of um, the community and sharing, um, you know, the diagnosis of the disease? Um, talk us a little through that a little bit. Well, you know, being an African American with this disease, as with any other disease, your medical the issue of dealing with medical is always going to be a little different. Um, mine is always a, even a little more different because I'm so young. And so when I'm trying to tell people, because I, I feel like my point of what I need to do is I need to get out and tell people about it. I want to tell as many people as I possibly can. If you find yourself forgetting, and not only forgetting, but if you find yourself just can't, you know, just little things, such as one day I think I was trying to make some spaghetti. I made spaghetti forever. And then I couldn't remember the ingredients. Little things like that, something is wrong. I mean, really, something you should at some point in time, even if you go to the doctor, Deborah, and it's not anything wrong, it's better to go to the doctor and have yourself checked out. But with the African-American community, I find myself when I'm trying to tell them, um, you know, go have yourself checked. The first thing they say is, well, why should I? Because if we have our own stigmas, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease that carries a large stigma anyway. And so people are already ashamed about whatever. So when you try to tell them, well, I have an issue, the first thing they say is, I'm just going to live my life the way it is. Or they'll tell you something like, you know, we have this thing in our community, and it's always been like this. What is done in the house stays in the house. So, therefore, we keep all the things that we need to do, and we need to get out and talk about it. We've always thought for years, oh, well, grandma's just senile. So, she does, maybe that's not what it is. That is what it is. You know, and so we, you know, we're ashamed. We, it basically, is we're ashamed. We don't want people to look at us a different way. And not only are, is the person self ashamed, but a lot of times, sometimes the caregiver is ashamed also. So when you have that problem, it doesn't make, it doesn't work well to get something accomplished. It just doesn't. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's it's similar, I think, in a lot of cultures. I'm half Asian, and I certainly know with my Chinese family, um, it's the same. It's, you know, if you have illness or something, you you hide it. You don't really talk about it. Um, yes. And and so I can imagine, um, you know, it's it's no matter what race you are, it's, it's similar with many cultures. But I, I'm curious about your experience as an African-American within your own family with having such a high prevalence of the disease um you know you said your your father and his six brothers or six siblings rather all were um had uh diagnosed with alzheimer's how did you deal with it that as a family was there did you experience that stigma or are you just a rarity um you know among the community i think um that's a hard question as i think I don't know. I think that people in the community that I came from pretty much knew or was seen that my, you know, that that my dad and his brothers and sisters were all having this. And they probably thought that's really weird. You know, that's probably what they thought. But it wasn't really an issue with me until it affected me until it happened to me and when it happened to me all of a sudden it was like when i first found out i didn't want anybody to know i'll be the first one to say i didn't want anybody to know i just kind of wanted to keep it a secret and then um i talked to my baby daughter one day and she just said you know mom why not why why are you being like that everybody's gonna know eventually anyway and so it just kind of i think it went like that for like six months and i thought why? why? Why do I need to be ashamed? If this is not something I reached out and just pulled in. It, it, you know, it just came to me. So my family, my, you know, I have a mom, a loving mom. I have, you know, sisters and brothers. They all, they all hold me really close. They, they check on me every day. They, they really are there for me. And so it's it's not a problem with my immediate family, and you know, I, and I have great friends. So we all we're all handling it really good. I think for a minute there, they probably were. I can't believe this is happening not to Athena, but now we know that it is it is happening, and so we just have to, you know, love each other and just do the best we can for it. That's that's what we do. Talk to me a little bit about about um, the prevalence of Alzheimer's um, in the African-American um, community. Do we know why? I mean, you know, you're an advocate now of the, the Alzheimer's Association. I know, you know, you're, you're obviously not a medical doctor, um, but do we know um, why uh, the reasons behind um, the higher risk factor for African-Americans? When I spoke with my doctor about it, um, he said that he thought that we had it because of a lot. A lot has to do with the foods that we eat, or the, the our diet. Our uh, diet had a lot to do with it, and he also said he thought that a lot of it was because we're not. We don't um, take a second to to do exercising and and things like that. You know, you can never. You can't just put because if we knew. If we knew Deborah, the answer to that question, we would be rich. All of us would be rich. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know why it, it affects us, but I know the reason why a lot of it is going on and continues with us is because, again, when it happens to us, we, you know, we don't take the time. Oh, maybe most of us do, but we don't take the time to jump into the situation right then and start trying to see what we can do for ourselves. Yeah. I think. I think. That may not be true, but I think. Because when all people are like you that's like that, I try to stay there like, well, if it happens to me, that's just it. And I'm thinking, okay. And, and you know, I, I think it's wonderful that the African-American community has a spokesperson like you because it is so critical to get more African-Americans into cl um, clinical trials, into research, so mm -hmm. scientists can really determine um, what the risk factor is, uh, you know, in order. Have you participated in these trials, Artina? I'm scheduled for a trial. Um, the reason why they did not actually let me do a trial yet is because I also have epilepsy. And so many of the trials that they wanted to try or wanted me to try for, they, they needed me to stop taking my epilepsy medicine. 
And I can't, I can't, even though I haven't had a, a, um, an epileptic seizure in years, I still don't want to take that chance for this. You know, it's, it's just, it's like a, yeah, I don't know, yeah. yeah a bad situation either way. But I did get called for a trial where I won't have to take my medicine. And I think I'll be going to see them in Atlanta um, in three weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. And I mean, they do call Alzheimer's diabetes type three. Does diabetes run in your family? No, not at all. My mom, I think my mom has like, she doesn't have, uh, uh, was it number two? She doesn't have that one where she has to take a, a, insulin. a insulin, nothing like that. My father did not have diabetes until he actually went to the nursing home doing the last part and they because he was just laying there still i don't know what they call they why that happens but he started to have started being diabetic but other than that we don't have a strong case of diabetes in my family no so tell us a little bit about what's the message that you hope to get out there um now that you are a representative of the alzheimer's um association and Tell us what, what the message is and what you've learned um, so far on this journey. This journey has taught me, Deborah, to be a strong person. To be strong, I have to not only be strong for myself, but I also sometimes feel like I need to be strong for my family and let them know my husband is, is my, my backbone. He is there for me every single day. So he's strong for me. I just realized that we have to be strong because when that time does come, and we all know that that time is going to come, when that time does come, we want to be able to just embrace it and say, this is what happens. I want, you know, I not only reach, I'm not only trying to reach out to, to the African-American community, I'm trying to reach out to everybody and say, you know what, if this happens to you, please, you know, get up and say, you know what? I can do this. I can do this. Because if you have that positive attitude, I am so convinced with all the people that I know who have uh, the, the early onset, because they have such strong personalities, because they're willing to move and be busy, that you would never know them. If you saw them in the street, you would never say, oh, that person has Alzheimer's. I want, that's why I want them because when people say you have Alzheimer's, I say, yes, really? I do. And I, and I live with it joyfully every single day. Well, I think that uh, we are so lucky to have spoken to you. You are not only an inspiration to the African American community, but to the world. I mean, what a great attitude. And thank you for sharing your story. I mean, it's, it's um, not often we find people diagnosed with Alzheimer's with such a bright attitude and we're so inspired by you. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you again. Thank you, Deborah, for having me on. I was, I'm so thrilled. I can't tell you how thrilled I am, but th thank you again. Okay, you're a pleasure to meet you and we will keep in touch. Um, we'd love to hear more about your advocacy work. So stay in touch with us. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. So for more of these interviews, um, we are always going to post them on beingpatient.com uh, for the patient perspective, which we um, feel it has great value to add to the conversation on Alzheimer's disease. Please um, join our Facebook group um, or sign up for our newsletter on beingpatient.com to hear more about these talks. And thanks so much for joining us.